going, church. I love being here with my family. Y'all are my family. And so I love getting to spend time with y'all, especially in this capacity. There we go. Real nice. All right. Um, but again, for those of you who don't know, my name's Kinsey Marquez, and I help lead our OC youth. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Um, if you have a, I'll be a, a shameless plug right here. If you have a 7th through 12th grader, uh, OC Youth is a place to be for them this summer. We're, gonna, we're pouring into them, but we're also having tons of fun. We started our Summer Olympics uh, this Friday, and it was crazy. Did y'all have a good time? Yes. I was like, yes. We had a huge water slide. It was intense and crazy. Shout out to Miss Sally for always opening her home for us. I know. I, uh, and we have other people who open up to Miss Jessica and other things when we don't have Miss Sally, but we're super grateful for you guys because if we didn't have you guys, there's no way that we could have OC Youth Life Group. So we're grateful for y'all. Um, but we had a blast this Friday. So if you want some more information, you can always find me in the back. Uh, we actually have something super special for our OC Youth today. It's called uh, Sunday Hangout. I'm going to say Sunday Hangout. So if you have a 7th through 12th grader, you can drag them to the back after. We're, we're going to have it in the library. It's where we're going to go deeper in our faith. We have lunch provided for your kids, and we're going to just dive a little bit deeper. We have one of our leaders leading us, and it's uh, about how to do the three circles. So you want to make sure they're there. This summer, we're trying to empower them and challenge them on how to share their faith. Uh, so if they can do it now, then they can do it when they're older, right? They don't have to wait. So let's go ahead and pray. Thank you, Jesus, for a day. Thank you for waking us up and putting breath in our lungs, Lord. We love you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity that we get to come into your house today, worship you, praise you, and to get a word. I pray that you open up our ears and open up our hearts ready to receive this word. Lord, I pray that you speak through me, God, Lord, that it's not me speaking, but Lord, you speaking through me. And Lord, we love you so much. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so if I seem tired, it's because I am. <laughs> uh, I recently have a new baby boy, uh, Prince. Yes, he's so precious. I, <laughs> my husband's in the back with him on his chest. He's two and a half months old. He's doing well, but and he's been actually such a trooper. He's been sleeping really well through the night, but just recently, man, he's been a, like, it was last night. I'll just be honest. It was like, I didn't half it's on me I'll be honest I didn't go to sleep till about one and then he woke up at three then five then seven so it was a good time so yeah if, if you're a parent you've been there um we're built different now like you just gotta you just gotta adjust and redo so if I look like I'm about to fall asleep it's because I am <laughs> So <laughs> we're just going to go and dive into our main, uh, one of our main verses for Disciple, the series. It's Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Man, we love this verse here. It's really uh, one of our big mantras. It says, therefore, go and make what? Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we love this verse. This is, again, the great commission that God has given us to do. Um, but in case we're just going to break it down a little bit before we get into our message, it says, therefore, go make disciples. A disciple is someone who's just a teacher, uh, a student to learn. So when God has called us to be his disciples, we're learning his word, applying it to our lives and becoming more like him each and every single day. And we continue to read. This is a command he's given us. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptizing is the second step. After you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the second step that you do is that you get baptized. And this is you going public in your faith. You saying, I'm going down with the old, coming up with the new, and I'm walking the journey out with the Lord. So if you haven't had the opportunity to opportunity to do that and you would like to guess what january 23rd we have baptism so you can sign up on your onechurch.com check it out july june did i say july let's pray for her reach out your hands and pray <laughs> Nah, I warned you, I did, I did, I did. So we're in this together. And I didn't have no coffee or nothing. I had the, I had a spicy little sandwich, messed up my tummy. But we are having baptisms June 23rd. June, not January. So sign up at youronechurch.com. <laughs> and we're going to continue, it says, in teaching them to obey. Everyone say, obey. 
everything I have commanded you. And this is my, one of my favorite parts. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Aren't you thankful that God is with us every step of the way? He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's with us. He goes before us. He goes behind us and he's beside us. Um, it's such a, I, I love that because I could, obviously we cannot do it without him. So we need him with us. So we're just going to recap real quick what we've already talked about. Week one, Pastor Angie taught that God has more for us. Everyone say God has more for us. Week two, Pastor Ken brought the word. It says, start your day with Jesus. Everyone say, start your day with Jesus. And the week that we're talking about today is love each other. Everyone say, love each other. Or love one another, but love one another. That's what we're talking about. So this is with the verse that we're going with. John 13, 35. It says, by this, everyone will know you're my disciple if you love one another. Everyone say, love one another. So we're going to talk about four action steps on how we can love one another in our current relationships, relationships that we already have in our lives, how we can make them better. Um, So uh, the first one, everyone say nurture, important relationships. Again, I just had my, my son Prince about two and a half months ago. And they say every kid is different, especially when you, you know, the birthing story, everything in between, how they act. They already have their own personalities and cadences about themselves. So when I had Prince, the birth was different than Presley. I sort of knew what to expect, but still not 100%. Um, but when Prince came into this world, he, um, usually when the baby comes out, they come out crying or they cry pretty quickly after they come out. Prince didn't. And so I was on some like pain. I had an epidural, praise God for those. So I had an epidural and they gave me some other medications because some things were going on. So I was sort of out of it. I was there, but I was gone. Um, I could go into detail, but I'm not gonna do that to you guys. Um, But I was sort of out of it, but I knew like, hey, my son's not crying. Um, And they're like, it's fine. And the nurses, they you think that they'd be so gentle with them, but they're like slapping the baby's back and you're like, whatever works, you know, uh, if you can get my kid to cry, that sounds great. Um, But what happened is he had amniotic fluid in his lungs and his nose and things. So they had to squeeze that out. He was coughing it up and eventually he started crying. But because of this, um, throughout um, probably like a month or two, he had lots of stuff inside of him. So he'd spit it up, things like that. And I didn't experience that with Presley. So it was, it was a little terrifying, uh, a little scary because it was a new experience for me. So when I brought him home, if you've ever brought a kid home, usually within a couple of days, you go to the pedi- uh, pediatric doctor and they get their first checkup to make sure everything's moving well. When we went, um, one of the biggest goals that you want for your newborn is for them to be at their birth weight, for them to be back where they need to be uh, when they were you know, born. And so when we went, Prince was not there quite yet because he was having this amniotic fluid stuff inside of his lungs that he really wasn't eating well. And so as a mom, you're like, oh my gosh. And so they're like, just come back later this week and we'll check. And so I made sure from that moment on, like, okay, every 15 minutes I'll offer him something to eat. Or I'll like be squeezing his, like there's a little suction thing. I'll be sucking out his nose and his throat, making sure that we're getting this stuff out. I took time, I put in effort and made sure that that would happen. And not always the case, but when we went back, he was above his birth weight, everything was great. And so we got to move on that way. But if I didn't nurture him, if I didn't have opportunity, gave him opportunity to grow, give him milk to grow, to get back to his birth weight, he would have starved to death. That's the initial thing. And so sometimes it sounds like, oh, that's a little intense. But it is. If you have a relationship in your life and you're not nurturing it, meaningful, important relationships, then you're going to starve that relationship. And so in... uh, It says right in Revelations 2, verse 4 through 5, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do things you did at first. And repent in this context doesn't mean like uh, repent, like I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but it means change your direction, do something different. So maybe it's in your relationship with um, your, your spouse or maybe with your kids or maybe there's a friendship that you've been neglecting. And so this in this moment, it's like change and do something different. Sometimes when our relationship with our spouse, it could just be you're arguing, you're doing X, Y, Z. And so you've hardened your hearts towards each other. So instead of pouring into each other, you're turning your backs on one another. And so instead of nurturing that relationship, you've turned away from it. And so maybe God's saying, hey, in this moment, I want you to nurture this relationship. So maybe that means even if you don't feel like it, even if it's hard, because 
relationships are hard. Loving others and one another is hard. It's not easy because people are people, right? We do people things. Um, so that means even when it's hard, put in the effort, put in the work and see what the Lord does. Um, if it's with your kids, do something different. Take them out. Take them on a one-on-one date. Even if they don't want to, drag them out. Do something different. Show them that you care in a way that you haven't done before. Um, do what you need to do. Fight for those in your life and nurture those relationships. So I challenge you today to nurture a relationship in your life. One of the fourth action steps on how we can love one another in our current religious relationships is number two, restore broken relationships. Everyone say restore broken relationships. Uh, I guess I have kids now, so I just use them for all my examples. But um, my daughter is now two years old. And if you've ever uh, experienced a two-year-old, it's a good time. It's a good time. Um, she I, I won't rag on Presley. She's a beautiful, loving, smart, kind girl, but she's a stubborn girl, um, and she stands by her convictions. She does. Um, so with Presley, we have our two-month-old, and it's just been me and her. We've been rocking since day one together all the time, and so when we bring somebody else new into the group, it's like, when's this dude going home? Like. <laughs> I don't know why he's still here. And she's gotten a lot better. She loves her brother. She's excited to see him in the morning. But sometimes it's nice to get the attention that you, you deserve. And so in this moment, I was having prints on my legs, and we were just hanging out on the couch. And Presley was making me some papa. She was going to the, making it up in the kitchen, bringing it to me. And she's like, Mom, Mom. And I'm like, hey, hold on one second. I got to change your brother's diaper. And so as I turn to grab a diaper, she has a bowl in her hand and her intrusive thoughts won. She <laughs> nailed him in the head with it as hard as she could. And me and my, my husband sit next to me, we both with our heads over. We we're like, Presley. And so, you know, she immediately starts crying. My husband gets on to her um, and we're disciplining her. And we're like, OK, now apologize and say you're sorry. She just immediately starts breaking down again. And this is when it becomes the battle of the wills. <laughs> <laughs> and I fold quicker. Paris does not. <laughs> so when in this moment, he's like, okay, you need to say sorry to your brother. And we just want her just, and she says sorry all the time. That's like one of her mantras that she says to us. Sorry, mommy. Oops, my bad. Sorry, mommy. And so we know she can say it because that's not the problem. So we're like, say sorry to your brother. Like that wasn't really nice to do. And she's crying, crying. And Paris is like, okay, listen, this is what you need to do. And she starts crying, crying, crying. We discipline her. We tell her this is what we're going to do. You want to go sit in time? I'm out and she's like Ooh. and so I get down and I'm like okay Presley is it nice to hit people with bowls and she's like no and I was like uh do you think should you have hit your brother with a bowl no are you sorry no <laughs> So we like we've established that she knows it's wrong we've established that she shouldn't have done it but she continues to say no. And so my husband asked her several different ways. Presley, are you sorry for hitting your brother with the bowl? No. <laughs> Can you say sorry? I mean, he starts crying. Presley, are you sorry for hitting your brother with the bowl? No. And we're like, oh my gosh. And so like, I'm looking at Paris and like something inside me died. And I was like, is she okay? Like, what are we raising? How are we going to discipline her? And so I was like, does she have empathy? And so I was just thinking all these things in my head. And so uh, anyways, we're like, okay, well, you're going to go to timeout. And so, but before we put her in timeout, we wanted to make, she, you know, had to change her diaper. She's, and we're changing her diaper. And she looks up at her dad. She's like, I'm sorry, daddy. And so we're like, I was like across the room. I was like, praise the Lord. <laughs> like, we're not going to have to do anything crazy. So uh, she apologized to dad. We're like, are you sorry for hitting brother? She's like, yes. And then uh, so we brought Prince over to her. She gave him a kiss, gave him a hug. And for the rest of the day, an angel, beautiful. But in that moment, it was crazy. But uh, we're going back to restoring broken relationships. Sometimes you can be prince and something has happened to you. Someone has hurt you with their words or their actions. Um, and you didn't ever ask for it. You were just hanging out and something bad happened to you. Or maybe you're Presley in this situation. Maybe you have actually hurt somebody. Maybe you have said hurtful things. Maybe you have done hurtful things and you never apologize for them. And so you're letting someone else walk in hurt and uh, bitterness and anger. So there's two sides of this spectrum, right? Of maybe you need to apologize and maybe you need to forgive someone. And I never want to diminish anybody's hurt of what has happened to you because 
we live in a broken world and bad things happen and people say horrible things, people do horrible things. And so we can get truly hurt. And sometimes if we never get that reconcile, we can live in anger, we can live in bitterness and we can live in hurt and we can carry that around daily. But that's not ours to carry. We're supposed to give that and surrender that to the Lord. Um, but when we surrender, we also have to offer, offer up forgiveness to that person. It doesn't mean that person is going to forgive, like, accept that we forgive them or even think that they're in the wrong. Maybe like, no, I didn't even do anything wrong to you. Why are you asked, like, saying that you forgive me? Uh, but to restore those relationships. And the word of God, it says, do all that you can to restore broken relationships. Um, it also says in Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgave you. Man, we I often forget this. I forget that God's grace is for everyone, not just for me. And so I'll, I'll be like, I can't believe they did that. That was horrible. But then the Lord really checks me and says, hey, if I forgive you, you should forgive them. Forgive them as I forgave you. And so the Lord has called us to restore those broken relationships. So I challenge you today to do that, whether you're Presley in this situation and you need to actually go and ask for forgiveness and say, I'm sorry for what I've done. Get pride out of your heart, step out of the way and say, hey, you know what? I shouldn't have talked to you like that. That was, uh, that was wrong to do. Hey, I shouldn't have behaved the way I did. I'm sorry for that. And then if maybe if you're on that receiving side, open your heart ready to receive. And sometimes forgiveness doesn't happen right in the moment, but it's something that we have to do continuously. We have to bring it back to the Lord, say, hey, I'm still struggling with this to forgive this person. Lord, I bring this back to you. I don't want to hold on to this. I don't want to have anger, bitterness in my life. And so really when you forgive them, you're actually setting yourself free and walking in the freedom that God has for you. So that's uh, one of the important things that we need to do is to restore a broken relationship. The third thing that we can do uh, to better our current relationships is redefine harmful relationships. Everyone say redefine harmful relationships. Proverbs 13, 20 says, he who walks with the rise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. And in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, 1533, it says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So I, I work with our youth. I hang out with them a long time. I've been doing youth ministry for a hot minute. I'm young, but I've been in the game a minute. So uh, this is something that we've been, uh, that we always talk about because not just for them, but even for us as adults, those who you keep around really become who you are. And so, um, and this is not saying that you can't be friends with unbelievers, but it's mean the closest people in your circle need to be those who are pushing you closer to Christ. Um, because I use this example a lot. If you have a sponge, everyone knows a sponge. If you put it in dirty dish water and you soak it up, what you're going to squeeze out is dirty dish water. So whatever environment you're in, you're going to be soaking that up. And when time gets tough, instead of squeezing out the fruits of the spirits, love, joy, peace, and patience, you're going to be squeezing out bitterness, anger, all these different kinds of things that the Lord does not want for us. And a lot of this can be, a lot of this can be avoided if we just keep those relationships right. So redefining harmful relationships. Um, in Second Corinthians six. Verse 14 through 15 says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. So yoked, uh, I'm just going to explain what a yoke is. And I'm probably not going to do an amazing job because I'm not an uh, agricultural girl. But what it is, is if you have two oxen, so I just want you to imagine two oxen side by side. One is smaller, one is larger. And there's this thing that is yoking them together. They call it the yoke. It's a wooden thing, and it just basically attaches them together. And so what they would do is they would, uh, they would either use them to, like, plow the fields, uh, move heavy things. But what would happen if they're unequally yoked with the, the ox, if the stronger one and a weaker one were yoked together, this is what would happen. The strong one would go faster, but the slower, weaker one would end up curving and having them actually go in circles instead of going forward. And so a lot of us in our personal relationships are wondering, why am I stuck here? Why can't I move forward with my life? I feel like I'm never getting out of this situation. I feel like I'm just stuck here. I feel like the Lord has more for me, but I, I can't move from here. And I'm just going in circles and circles and circles. Check your friends. Check your environment. Maybe you need to redefine some harmful relationships in your life. And so... We don't need to be unequally yoked. 
So if we continue knowing that, as we read this verse, it says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteous and wickedness have in common? Or what does fellowship, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Balaam? And that's a demon. <laughs> so what does Christ and demon have in common together? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? The answer is nothing. They have nothing in common. Again, this is not saying that you can't have friends who are unbelievers. That's not what we're saying. But we're saying that you just can't have common relationships. You can't be yoked together. Because when they're yoked, the oxen, they have a mission to do. They have a plan to do. So we as believers, we have a mission to do. The Lord has given us a great commission. And if we're yoked with unbelievers, it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to be a disciple it's hard to get out of our addictions if we're hanging out with our addicts. It's hard to hang. It's hard to get over our hurt and our habit if we're hanging out with that person who brings hurt and habit back into our lives. It's hard to stop behaving and talking about these people if I'm constantly with this group of people who's talking this way. How am I going to change it? I redefine harmful relationships in my life. So that's what we need to do is redefine those harmful relationships. The last uh, step on how we can love one another in our current relationships is initiate meaningful relationships. Everyone say that with me. Initiate meaning relationship, meaningful relationships. <laughs> we need to in, uh, initiate meaningful relationships. Um, it says you need a Paul, you need a Barnabas, and you need Timothy. Um, so Paul is a mentor. You need someone in your life to mentor you. It doesn't matter what age you are, where you're at. You need someone that you can call on to ask questions for, that you can uh, have encouragement from, someone who will give you godly wisdom and point you back to Jesus in times of trouble and pain, who will pray for you in times of need. Um, you need a mentor in your life to help you through. Maybe they've already walked through it, and it's uh, always easier to get information from someone who's already walked through it, so maybe you don't have to. So you need a mentor in your life. You need a Paul. The second one is you need a Barnabas. You need a friend, an accountability partner. And so a lot, these three can be found in life groups. So if you're not in a life group yet, you need to sign up for one. There's a life group table in the back after service. If you want a mentor, if you want a friend, and we're going to talk about the third one in just a second. If you want any of these, you need to get in a life group. That's where we can find them. Because uh, you, can't, you can't find them on the street probably. But majority, you will find it in life group and find it in your church. Find it with your friends here. But you need an accountability partner. An accountability partner is someone who can keep you in check, who can walk life with you and know, you know, important things about you. An accountability partner just isn't anybody. It's someone that you can trust, someone that walks with Jesus. Um, you know, like, well, I have accountability from my friend at work. Um, do they know Jesus? Do they love Jesus? Because in times where you're like, man, my husband's really getting on my nerves. Girl, screw him. We don't need him anymore. Like, you leave him right now. That's not an accountability partner, girl. That's someone who's taking you out to left field. That's not pointing you back to Jesus. That's pointing you back to the world, right? My dad's going to get me. But we're having a good time. So that's <laughs> you need an accountability partner. You need somebody in your life to keep in your corner, to keep you back in the line, to say, hey, that was actually you on the wrong. You need to go apologize to him, and you need to make that right. And so sometimes it's hard to hear from your accountability partner, but you need someone you can trust and someone who will give you godly wisdom to point you back on the right road. Um, and it could just be someone to keep you accountable to keeping in your word. Hey, let's do a Bible study together. Um, let's go to the same life group so we know that we're going the same time each week together. You need that person in your life. Um, I always had even accountability partner to work out when I was into that. I'm still into that, but I'm a mom now. So it's just, it's sporadic. It's rare. But uh, that's something that I would do growing up. I love to have somebody to run with me because if I'm running this race, I don't want to do it alone. I want to have somebody there with me to help keep pace, to push me in times that I need to be pushed. Um, so we need a friend that's an accountability partner. And lastly, we need a Timothy, someone that we can pour into. You need someone that you can pour into. So I even think about my youth. You're never too young to pour into somebody. You're never too, uh, you don't have to be the perfect Christian to pour into somebody. Sometimes we'll think, oh, I could, I could never, you know, speak life into someone or encourage them in that way. It's just, I'm not there yet. 
if you think you're going to get there and be perfect Christian, you're never going to be the perfect Christian uh, because we are people, right? But God has called you to go and make disciples. So you need to have somebody underneath you. You need to have someone that you can pour into. And so you need to have someone uh, in your life to do that. And remember, you don't have to be perfect. It actually pushes you closer to Christ when you have someone depending on you. Um, so let's say I, I told you I've been in the game for a hot minute. So I've had questions brought to me that I had no idea how to answer because I've never had that question. And so it drew, drew me closer to God to dive into his word, to find his truth in there. And so we need that in our lives. So you need a mentor, a friend that's an accountability partner and someone that you can pour into an apprentice. Um, so those are our four steps on how we can love one another in our current relationships. And I promise I'm almost done. I have just a quick four other points really quick that we're going to dive into. Uh, that leads us back to our main verse today, which is John 13, 35. Everybody read this with me. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Uh, like I said earlier, sometimes it's really hard to love one another, right? Because people are people and people do people things. Um, and so sometimes it's not our natural thing to uh, be loving. It's actually the opposite, right? Um, to be honest, I have, I don't know if it's the way I was raised or if it was just uh, just different things in my life of how this occurred. But I truly believe this occurred because of the prayer that I prayed uh, from a young age. Loving one another and loving others has always been easy for me. It's just been something that's easy. Um, and that's not to toot my own horn, but this is truly because of a prayer I prayed when I was young. I heard my mom pray it, and so probably legit from the age six, I prayed this prayer. Uh, so I believe the Lord had to manifest, like put this into my life and put it into motion. I prayed for the Lord to break my heart for what breaks his. I prayed to have eyes to see like he sees. And I think that really did change my life. Even from such a young age, I prayed that all the way up until now. I still pray it because sometimes I can feel my heart getting hard into this world to people and situations. But if I pray, Lord, open my eyes to see how you see. Let me see your people the way you do. Break my heart for what breaks yours. It truly does change things. So here are some four action steps on how to help us love one another more effectively. Um, and they all have to do with praying. So the first one is pray to care for others. Um, pray to care for others. So in your quiet time with the Lord, pray to care for others. Lord, give me a heart to care for others. In Mark 2, there's a story of, you probably have heard it before, of a paralyzed man and his friends who carried him to Jesus. If you haven't heard it, I'm just going to share a little snippet of it. There was a paralyzed man, and his friends desperately wanted him to, to get him to Jesus to be healed so he could walk again. And so these friends cared for him so much that they didn't stop after an obstacle, obstacle came. They continued to go forward. Jesus was teaching in a house, and it just became filled. And then there was a larger crowd that even filled there. And so they couldn't get to Jesus. There was an obstacle there. They could have given up right there and said, oh, we tried, buddy. We carried you like three miles already. So we're here. Like, we tried. But they said, no, we're not going to stop here. They cared, and they loved him. So they said, you know what? I'm going to do whatever it takes to get you back to Jesus, to get you to Jesus. I want you to get this miracle. I want you to get this healing. So what they did was they put him onto the roof and I can't imagine I am so like physically weak <laughs> that I can't imagine having to like hoist somebody up and I know there's probably like a couple of them doing this but this is like physical work not only are they doing like mental work getting him there but they're doing physical work to get their friend to Jesus so they lifted him up into the roof and what they had to do was they had to dig through the roof to lower him down so not only did they have to do physically get him up there Oh, and then physically open it. But they're probably going to have to repair that man's roof. So there's so many things in that. So they had to do their time. They spent their time, physical energy, and probably they're going to spend some money in their, their time fixing this afterwards. So they cared for him so much that this is what they did. They lowered him down to Jesus so that he could get his healing. And so my question is to you, do you care for your friends that much? Do you care for the people in your life that much? It's convicting. So... That's the first one, uh, steps that can, we can effectively love one another is pr care, pray to care for others. The second one is pray to encourage others. Encouragement means to lift the spirit. Romans 15, 2 says, we should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. Uh, if we want to build each other up in the Lord, a simple encouragement 
is it's easy to do. Um, sometimes it causes you to step out of your comfort zone. But once you do it, not only do you feel better, but you're encouraging someone and you're lifting their spirits. And so uh, a simple encouragement could be, hey, man, you have a great smile. Has anyone ever told you that? You have a great smile. You just light up a room. I appreciate you being here. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, you could be at the grocery store. Someone's bagging your bags up. Wow, you're really fast at doing it. Like, that's so lame. But like, wow, you're fast at doing that. Uh, and they could have been having a bad day. And they're like, you know, what? I am good at this. Like, I, you know, this is purpose. I'm doing this for my family. And someone sees that I'm doing a good job. Um, it could be just small things like that. You see a mom and her kids, man, you're crushing it. You're doing such a good job. That's something I've noticed more after becoming a mom. I'm like, you're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. Like truly you just encouraging one another. You don't know what that will do to uplift their spirits. Um, so the Lord has called us to be encouragers. And so, uh, to love one another more effectively, we need to pray to encourage others. The third point is to pray, to protect others. Everyone say protect. In Ecclesiastes 4, 12, it says, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two who stand back to back can conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. Uh, I love this verse. Um, and this is like, it sounds like it's off topic, but off topic, but it's not. Has anybody in here watched Planet of the Apes? Yes. All right, so I love that. Me and Paris actually just watched all the movies that uh, that we could that were online for free, and so we watched all <laughs> we watched all of those movies, and they're really good. Um, and if you've never watched it, here's a little summary. Here's a pitch to watch it. But in this, basically, there's a trial going on uh, to kill Alzheimer's, and they were testing monkeys. And long story short, there was a baby who was there who was injected with it from his mother. And he's just super smart. His name was Caesar. And as these movies go on, it's like it turns into like an apocalyptic thing. And it's crazy. The monkeys rise up and they're just running stuff. Um, there's still like other civilization stuff going on. But what really got me is the, uh, the thing that Caesar, the ape, would say to the other apes. He would say, apes... Uh, ape alone weak and he had a stick and he would break it um and then he would put the two sticks together but he said ape together strong and it didn't break and so together we are strong i know it sounds silly but i was like that's in my mind because a lot of times we can try to in this culture it's like canceling one another you're looking for someone to make a mistake you're looking for them to slip up and be like oh gotcha like you did that but that's not how we're supposed to operate as Christ followers, as doing this together, as being disciples of the Lord. We're supposed to love one another, and that means protecting one another. And so that means in times of trouble and uh, things that are going on, it's like, okay, how can I protect my brother and sister in Christ? How can I come behind them and help them? I also think when I was younger, and even now, if I had a sleepover, I like to be back to back with a person because I know they got my back when I'm asleep. If something pops off, we're ready. We're ready to go. Um, I was an interesting child. I would, <laughs> I would keep um, like a tambourine stick under my bed. I was just ready. Whatever comes up, I'm ready. Like you're not going to find me on a day that I'm not ready. But I, I love when I had someone to sleep with, hang out with. That way I, you just feel safer, right? You feel uh, together. And that's why I hate when my husband's gone because that means I got to be ready. Like I'm on alert. I got to sleep like this on the bed. It's not comfortable. I can't sleep back to back. So that's what we want to do. We want to protect one another. We want to be there for another. So that means praying, Lord, protect my heart uh, from others. Or protect my heart to pray for others. Uh, the fourth and final step to help us love one another more effectively is simply pray for others. Uh, Ephesians 6, 18 says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Uh, I love that verse, and it, I think pr protecting, uh, uh, praying to protect others and praying for others sort of go hand in hand of how I'm going to present it to you. Uh, my mom, she would pray for us, so would my dad, but they would pray for us as we were younger. And I believe the Holy Spirit works, and he moves. Um, he connects us all, and so he would he'd be speaking to my mom, or my mom just has great instincts. Uh, but I believe it was the Holy Spirit where he would always be like, hey, you need to check on Kenzie in this area. She's not doing well. She's doing something she's not supposed to be doing. And it was always correct. <laughs> so by praying in the Holy Spirit, by 
her being connected to the Holy Spirit and praying uh, for me, the Lord spoke to her and gave her discernment and gave her wisdom in order to help correct me and redirect me. He used her as a vessel to do that for me. But if we're not praying for others, we can't encourage them. We can't say, hey, you know what? I just, I want you to be careful in this area of your life. I want to protect you in this area of your life. And this doesn't mean that you can be like, I prayed the Lord tell me that you were doing this, 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 and this. That's not it. It's saying, hey, I, oh, I was praying for you, and I just wanted to encourage you and pray for you in this area. Are you doing okay? Are you doing okay? I want to pray for you. I want to love on you in this way. And so sometimes when we pray for another, the Lord can fill us up and give us word of encouragement for others or word of discernment and wisdom for others to help them through a situation. And it could be something that they need in that moment. And so it's praying for the Lord to be a vessel to speak through you. Um, so those are four active steps that we can be, help us be more effective in loving one another. Um, and we're closing it up with our John thirteen thirty five. It says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciple. If you love one another, everyone say, love one another, love one another. I want to challenge you to think of the things that we've talked about. Um, there was like eight points really, but they were split up into current relationships and things that we can do to move forward. Uh, in our relationships. But I want to challenge you to think, am I being a good disciple of Christ? Am I being loving to others? Am I being, am I being loving to one another? Or am I representing Christ poorly? Because if we're representing Christ poorly in our relationships, who wants to be a disciple if we can't love one another? So we're not truly being a disciple if we're not loving one another. So we, I want to challenge you this week to think, okay, how can I better be a disciple and love one another? And those people in my life, how can I do that? Even as strangers, how can I love them more effectively? So let's put into the points that we talked about this week. Start praying over them. Start praying for the Lord to move through you to love one another. Um, but you can't love one another and you can't be a disciple if you do not have the first relationship that matters the most, a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we, uh, we always do this here at One Church because this is why we're here. This is what, why we do what we do is to present the gospel to you. Um, to give you an opportunity to make Jesus Lord of your life, to follow him and to move forward with him. And so uh, we're going to pray the prayer of salvation today. And again, this is if you've never made Jesus Lord of your life. And today you're saying, hey, I would love to be a disciple of Christ. This is what I want to do. I want to follow Jesus. This is what I want to do. This prayer is for you. So if you can go ahead and close your eyes and bow your head. Um, and you can repeat this after me. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I surrender my life. Wash me clean. I believe that you are Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that you went to the cross to die for my sins, and that you rose again on the third day for my victory. I believe in my heart and I make confession with my mouth that Jesus is my Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you pray that prayer for the first time and you decide to make Jesus Lord of your life, surrender completely to him, then I'm just, I'm so excited that we get to do this, that you got to do this here with us. But if you did pray that prayer for the first time, I want you to go ahead uh, after service. You can go to our guest services table. There's a, a card that you can fill out. We want to give you a Bible to help you with your walk with the Lord. Uh, we're just not a church that prays it and that's it and you're done. We really truly want to help you walk it out. Like our whole series here is Disciple, a walk of spiritual growth. We want to walk that out with you. We want to give you resources to help you walk that out. So uh, do you receive that word today? Amen. God is so good. He's so faithful. And I, I, I'm so glad that I got to hang out with you guys today. Um, be blessed.